Uh, Tony Greenstein is going to be talking about what is Zionism. And uh, after uh, an introduction for around about half an hour to 40 minutes or so, we're then opening up to comments and uh, discussion and questions from the floor. Right, okay, I... thank you, comrades. I understand there's quite a number of people going by my name uh, in this session, so I welcome uh, my counterparts and reflections too. Uh, my apologies for not having been able to uh, begin this uh, talk last week, but as some people may be aware, uh, I was detained elsewhere and not able to make the meeting. Uh, however, I am here now uh, and I hope everybody finds it interesting. Zionism. What is Zionism? It's a good question, isn't it? If you mention the word Zionism in the Labour Party, they will take that as meaning Jews uh, and you will get almost get a, an automatic ticket to suspension and probable expulsion. Although we were accused of conflating Zionism and uh, being Jewish and therefore blaming Jews for Zionism, but it is in fact the Labour Party hierarchy which makes that confusion and they do it quite deliberately. Uh, uh, the attitude of the Labour Party to Zionism uh, was probably best summed up by Shami Chakrabarti in her report in 2000, June 2016, when she said, and it's quite correct, that of all the British political parties, the L Labour Party has the longest and most consistent record of support for Zionism. And that is true. Uh, there is no doubt of it. And uh, she went on to say uh, in a section uh, entitled Zionism and Zionists, it seems to me that it is for all people to self-define their political beliefs and I cannot hope to do justice to the rich range of self-descriptions of both Jewishness or Zionism. So there you have a conflation. Uh, even within the Labour Party that I have heard, what I will say is that some words have been used and abused by accident to design so much as to blur, change or mutate their meaning. My advice to critics of the Israeli state and or government is to use the term Zionist advisedly, carefully and never euphemistically or as part of personal abuse. Well, I am happy to use the term Zionism in its exact meaning. Uh, what is Zionism? Well, the dictionary definition of Zionism is the movement uh, to establish a Jewish state, a Jewish state in Palestine. Though I have to say uh, the original and early Zionists, uh, Leo Pinsker and Theodor Herzl, who's credited as being the founder of political Zionism, were not too concerned about where the Jewish state was. Herzl, in his founding pamphlet, The Jewish State, uh, which was written in 1894-5, uh, posited that Argentina might be a suitable alternative. And in fact, a number of Jewish settlements uh, subsidized by a Jewish multimillionaire at the time uh, were established in, in Argentina. But uh, Zionism itself uh, is both an ideology and a movement. Uh, and we have to understand it uh, as such. Now, Zionism is a political movement. Uh, it, it is not, uh, and it, this is important to understand, it's not a religious movement, although it clothes itself and masquerades as a Jewish religious movement or a movement that owes everything to the Jewish religion. It cannot be understood in terms of the Jewish religion. So, for example, uh, Ephraim Mervis, uh, the chief rabbi of England, uh, stated uh, in the Telegraph in, uh, in an attack on Ken Livingstone back in, on the 3rd of May uh, 2016, one can no more separate it, Zionism, from Judaism than separate the city of London from Great Britain. In other words, the two were inextricably intertwined. Now, uh, Zionism, like most nationalist movements, rewrites history backwards. Uh, and I, I, will uh, I will come into this in a, uh, greater detail. Just to say that 
when Zionism arose at the end of the 19th century, there were no greater opponents of it than the religious or Orthodox Jews. I mean, the theology of Orthodox Judaism held that God had exiled the Jews from Palestine or whatever you call it. And until the arrival of the Messiah, they should not, they should, they are forbidden from going back to Palestine in any collective sense. So this was uh, the attitude of the vast majority of Orthodox Jews at the time. Of course, uh, religion changes. Uh, as Abraham Leon, I, I don't know whether anyone has heard of Abraham Leon, but he, he was a famous uh, Jewish Marxist, a Belgian Trotskyist who died in Auschwitz. And he wrote a book, uh, and it's a book I, I recommend to everyone who wants to understand what we used to be called the Jewish question, because it's a materialist history of the Jews. Uh, and as I said, Zionism has rewritten the history of the Jews backwards, like all nationalist movements do. But Leon was quite clear. He, he said, religion being an ideological reflection of social interest, it must perforce correspond to them. Today, religion does not at all constitute an obstacle to Zionism. In reality, just so long as Judaism was incorporated in the feudal system, the dream of Zionism was nothing but a dream and did not correspond to any real interest of Judaism. The Jewish tavern owner or farmer of the 16th century Poland thought of as little of returning to Palestine as does the Jewish millionaire in America today. So Leon really had a materialist understanding and analysis of the Jewish question. And this is important because Zionism arose from the Jewish question. And you have to understand, I mean, Abraham Leon categorized the Jews historically as what he called a people class. In other words, a caste, uh, and the Jews weren't the only caste. They performed certain tasks within medieval Europe, pre-capitalist Europe, uh, of a social and economic nature. They were the traders, or they, they were agents of money within an economy largely based on use values, not money. They occupied certain professions, diamond cutters, goldsmiths, and so on. And so the religion reflected that. Uh, and as the, uh, as the occupations of the Jews change, as the identity of the Jews change, so the religion itself changed. And today, you see that the vast majority of Orthodox Jews uh, are Zionists, either overtly or uh, de facto uh, Zionists, whereas historically uh, that was not the case. Uh, Zionism uh, was seen, uh, in the words of Bialik, uh, uh, as a false messiah. Now, Zionism has many myths, and the first myth and it's an important one because it's the whole basis of Zionism, is that the Jews, wherever they live in the world, whether it's in Britain or Argentina or America or Poland or wherever, the Jews constitute a single nation. Uh, and this is, uh, 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 as I said, a myth. The idea that people who live in all the continents and most of the countries of the world who speak a variety of different languages, who often have different religious, uh, uh, different religious attributes. They don't all follow the same customs and so on. The idea that they are a nation uh, is an absurdity. Uh, we can define uh, what a nation is, but I think it's commonly accepted that members of the same nation occupy the same territory, they have the same economic arrangements, they will speak the same language, they will have a cultural history of sort and so on. So what Zionism was really arguing is not that the Jews were a nation, but the Jews were a race. And uh, Zionism is above all a believer in the idea of a Jewish race. Uh, Zionism also believes, and, it, and you will hear this very commonly, that uh, anti-Semitism is the oldest hatred, that anti-Semitism has been a continuous factor in the existence of the Jews from time immemorial. For the last 2,000 years, ever since the majority uh, left or in Zionist parlance were exiled from Palestine, so they have suffered from uh, anti-Semitism. And, and 
let's be quite blunt, that, that's an absolute nonsense. It simply paints Jews as the eternal perpetual victims, which is the mirror image uh, of the Nazi idea that there was an eternal wandering Jew throughout the earth. Uh, it, it, it's a complete nonsense. Uh, it doesn't correspond to reality. Jews were agents in their own right. Jews in many ways were for large parts of European history were better off than uh, non-Jews. They were the they were engaged in things like money lending, tax farming, uh, stewards, uh, and so on. They were the intermediaries between the nobles and the peasantry. Uh, and there was a hatred which built up between the Jews and the peasantry because the peasants saw the Jews as their oppressors. And in many ways, the Jews were oppressors. And the attacks on Jews, which often occurred, were in essence a, a distorted reflection of an economic antagonism between them. But the idea that uh, anti-Semitism is one eternal constant raises the question, why should the Jews be subject to uh, anti-Semitism continuously? There must be something about the Jews that brings this on. Now, Zionism actually had an answer to that because uh, one of the fundamentals of Zionism is the negation of the diaspora, the Jewish diaspora. And I will go into this more in uh, future talks. Uh, but the idea was that the problem with Jews is that they were asocial, that they didn't fit in. They didn't get, they had certain bad habits, which they'd accumulated over the years, precisely because they had no national territory. Zionism was very much of the blood and soil, vokish variety, which believed that any people could only sustain its development and grow through an attachment to its own national soil. And that national soil was in Palestine. Uh, and so Zionism, in a sense, wrote off the Jewish diaspora, the 2000 years of Jewish existence in Europe uh, and outside Palestine uh, and held that it was of no consequence. There was no Jewish history other than the history of Jews in Palestine or Israel as it now is. And Leon, again, if I go back to Abraham Leon, he, he, he summed this up when he said, Zionism transposes modern antisemitism to all of history and saves itself the trouble of studying the various forms of antisemitism and their evolution. Uh, and it, since antisemitism is, is a, a topic which has been on people's minds ever since the attacks on Jeremy Corbyn, let me make it clear that antisemitism, as Leon said, fundamentally changed. The difference was between feudal or Christian antisemitism and antagonism based on actually what Jews did in, in terms of their social economic roles and racial antisemitism, which grew up with imperialism and colonialism at the end of the 19th century. Uh, and what is the difference? Quite simple, quite simple. Martin Luther uh, was second to none in, in his hostility and hatred of Jews. Uh, the founder of uh, Protestantism. But his hostility and enmity to Jews ended at baptize, the baptismal, baptizing and conversion. When Jews converted to Christians, they were Christians. But for the Nazis, it didn't matter whether you converted or not, because being Jewish was a racial, not a religious matter. And so you had the phenomena, for instance, in Nazi Germany, of people who were called uh, Christian Jews. They were Christian by religion, but Jewish by race. Uh, and that caused all sorts of problems with the Catholic Church, of course, uh, throughout Europe, because the Catholic Church fought uh, for its Jewish converts, not particularly for Jews, but for its uh, converts, that, that once converted, you were a Christian. They did not hold to a racial uh, idea. And the Zionist attitude to anti-Semitism, because Zionism, despite the idea that uh, the longing to return to Palestine had been inherent in Jews from the year dot, it, in reality, of course, this had not been the case. Uh, uh, Zionism was a reaction to anti-Semitism. Uh, anti-Semitism of the late 19th century, and in particular, in the Pale of Settlement, which is the area of Russia and Poland and Lithuania to which Jews were confined. 
and one of the earliest Zionists, uh, Leo Pinsker, uh, in 1881, in the pamphlet Auto Emancipation, defined uh, how Zionism sees anti Semitism. And he wrote Judeophobia. He, he, he called it, uh, he saw it as a, a disease. He was a doctor. He said, Judeophobia is then a mental disease. And as a mental disease, it is hereditary. And having been inherited for 2000 years, it is incurable. Uh, and that's, that's right. I mean, Zionism took as its starting point that anti Semitism was a disease, something inherent in the Gentile, the non Jew. And if you couldn't cure it, what was the point fighting it? Uh, uh, and that's why there was a the Zionist solution was to escape from, to run away from anti Semitism. Now, I've talked about the myths of Zionism. Uh, eternal anti-Semitism and the idea that Jews form a nation race, but there's a third, uh, a third uh, myth, which is after the fall of the Second Temple in 70 AD, uh, the Jews were exiled by the Romans. There is no evidence whatsoever for this, no evidence at all. In fact, what did happen was that the Jews of Palestine, the majority of them, could not sustain themselves. Those who stayed were pastoralists, farmers who easily assimilated to the, to the peoples surrounding them. But something like three million Jews in Palestine emigrated or they converted other, other non-Jews because Jew, Judaism at that time was a proselytizing religion uh, and did seek conversion. So when the Hellenic cities surrounding Palestine in the Middle East, Antioch, Seleucia, Alexandria, you found very, very large Jewish trading communities. In Alexandria alone, there was something like one million Jews. So at three quarters of the Jews of the time lived outside Palestine, not because they'd been forced out, but because economically it made good sense. I mean, the Jews were not the only uh, trading peoples. The Phoenicians who operated from Lebanon were likewise a trading people. Uh, and if you go uh, to many cities uh, and towns in Asia, for example, you will find merchant quarters where foreign uh, merchants would live and, uh, and conduct their trade. The fourth, and this is of course allied to the other myths, is that for 2000 years, the Jews longed to return to Palestine or Israel as it now is. Uh, and again, this is an absolute nonsense. Uh, for 400 years before the British took over in Palestine, the Ottoman Empire ruled Palestine. There were no borders, there were no passports. There was nothing to stop Jews returning or emigrating uh, to uh, Palestine. In fact, many religious Jews did, but they didn't do so for political motives. They did so because it was a religious uh, mitzvah, a, a religious commandment to go to study there and to die there. And they were supported by Chalukah, by, by charitable donations from uh, Jews uh, outside Palestine. And so it, it, by the time, by the middle of the 19th century, uh, the majority of Jews, in, the majority of inhabitants in Jerusalem were Jewish, Orthodox Jews living in poverty, uh, supported by people like Somoza Montefiore, uh, but they had no political ambitions. They didn't talk about a Jewish state. They were perfectly happy to live alongside the Arabs uh, of Palestine. Uh, and they were termed uh, by, for instance, Chaim Weizmann, who was one of the key leaders uh, of the Zionist organization. He became the first president of uh, Israel. He termed them the old Yeshuv. Yeshuv ref referred to the Jewish community in Palestine. The new Yeshuv was, were the Zionist settlers, but the old Yeshuv consisted mainly of the Orthodox Jews. And the Orthodox Jews were hostile to Zionism. Uh, they formed Agudat Yisrael, uh, in the early part of the 20th century, precisely in order to oppose Zionism. And in fact, the first political murder by the Zionists was in 1924 of a Dutch poet who was the leader of Agudat Israel, Jacob de Haan. And if you look that up, you will find uh, further details of that. He was also gay, but despite that, he was uh, the political leader of Agudat Israel. 
Now, the Zionists also refer to uh, in their argument that uh, Jews have always longed to go to uh, Israel, to the fact that every day religious Jews recite in their prayers next year in Jerusalem. And that's true. Yes, it is. It, but that is not a political longing. There was no practical implications of that. It was a spiritual. There was no practical implication. Sorry. Someone interrupted, but uh, I shall go on. Uh, the best example of this, incidentally, is when, because of the pogroms in Russia, uh, and also the poverty and the oppression of Jews, some two and a half million Jews from the middle of the 19th century to uh, 1914 emigrated uh, from Russia. 98, 99% of those didn't go to Palestine, they went to America and Britain, and to a lesser extent, Germany and France. Barely 1% of those who emigrated from Russia went to Palestine as settlers. And the majority of them turned back, uh, returned back because they couldn't uh, make a living there. So Bernard Lazar, who was a, a, an early Zionist, in his, but he broke from Theodor Herzl, wrote in his book, Anti-Semitism, Its History and Causes, it, that was issued in 1894, he said of the prayer next year in Jerusalem that this was simply an expression of the desire of Jew, Jewish people to be free. Now, I, th I think what we under have to understand about Zionism, therefore, is that it was a modern movement of the late colonial era. It, it wasn't a historical traditional movement from time immemorial. It arose in the specific conditions of the late colonial era. And the first Zionists were not Jewish, they were Christian Zionists. Uh, Cromwell, uh, who uh, was reputed to have allowed the Jews to return, in fact, they were already here, but living undercover, as it were, after having been expelled by Edward I in 1290. And there grew up uh, a movement for restorationism. And one of the leaders of this was Anthony Ashley, the seventh Earl of, of Shaftesbury, uh, who was all in favor of the Jews returning to Palestine. But he, he wasn't in favor of the Jews remaining in Britain. In fact, he was an opponent of Jewish emancipation because the Jewish bourgeoisie in Britain fought a long battle to establish their right, for example, to stand for parliament to be able to vote, to be able to take part fully in, in, in uh, civil affairs. And it was only in 1858, the first Jewish MP sat in the House of Parliament. And it wasn't only Anthony Ashley, Disraeli, Lord Palmerston, Napoleon, Ernest Laharan, who was the secretary to Napoleon III. They all talked about establishing a Jewish colony uh, adjacent to the Suez Canal and the reason was uh, was quite simple. It was seen by them, as it is seen, of course, by the United States today, as an advantage to have a stable settler state uh, under the guise of being Jewish on the banks of the Suez Canal. Remember, in those days, the prime, the jewel in the crown of the British Empire was uh, India, and the main route to India was the Suez Canal. So that was a strategic route. And having a stable pro-Western state uh, adjacent to it made sense uh, for the imperialists. And so we have, a, we have the situation where non-Jews, I mean, you, you can read, for instance, it was, it was part of a kind of romantic uh, imperialist movement. Uh, you'll remember George Eliot's Daniel Deronda, which was uh, a book in two parts, but the, the, the bad part of it was the Zionist part, uh, which went on lyrically about, uh, the, the desire of Jews to return to Palestine. Uh, of course, there was no such desire except in the minds of people like George Eliot. But Zionism itself uh, was not only a reaction to anti-Semitism, but also to Jewish emancipation. I, I mentioned that uh, in Britain, uh, Jews were emancipated in 1858. In fact, it was the French Revolution in 1789 uh, which first emancipated the Jews. Clément de Tonnerre in 1789 in the French Constituent Assembly said that to the Jews as individuals, everything. To the Jews as a nation, nothing. That, that was the attitude. And in Germany, uh, 
there were moves to emancipate in the German states, some earlier, some later, but by 1870, there was relatively full emancipation, although of course, that in itself provoked uh, a reaction amongst German anti-Semites following the financial crash in later years there. But even in Germany, uh, Jews had been emancipated. But the attitude to uh, emancipation by the Zionists, the first political Zionist was Moses Hess, who was uh, uh, who knew Karl Marx, uh, and he wrote a, a, a pamphlet on the Jewish question. And Hess was quite clear. He said, should it prove true, this is in his pamphlet, Roman Jerusalem, which is worth looking up. And he said, should it prove true that the emancipation of the Jews is incompatible with Jewish nationalism, then the Jew must sacrifice emancipation. Because when Jews were emancipated, when they were free from the ghetto, you, you saw a rapid Jewish assimilation to the non-Jewish population quite freely. I mean, in Germany, uh, it was approaching 50% at the beginning of the 20th century. And, and this caused horror amongst two sections of the Jewish community. The Orthodox, who saw Jews being lost uh, to uh, the Christian world, and secondly, amongst the Zionists. Who, who saw that the Jewish race or the Jewish nation was disappearing before their feet. And you still get a reaction from uh, many Orthodox Jews and Zionists who talk about the loss of Jews in the Holocaust, and then also talk about the loss of Jews in the same breath to assimilation or even abortion, uh, the same com comparison has been made. But who were the first uh, uh, first Zionist. I think it's worth just spending a little time on this. The, first, the, the very first, as I mentioned, was, was Moses Hess, who was a, a companion of Marx for some time and had some influence on the young Marx. And, Mar and Hess in his pamphlet, Roman Jerusalem, uh, which I say I, I do advise people to re read, he said of the Jews, the Germans hate the religion of the Jews less than the race. The Jewish race is a primary race, which accommodates itself to all conditions and retains its integrity. The Jewish type has always remained indelibly the same throughout the centuries. Now, if you didn't know it was Moses Hess, you could have thought it was a Nazi uh, ideologue. And indeed, Hess was uh, a virulent anti-Semite. Uh, anti he spoke of, quote, the mystery of Jewish and Christian blood worship. And Robert Whit. Wistrich, the late Robert Wistrich, was a professor at Tel Aviv University and an ardent Zionist, nonetheless spoke of Hess's virulent anti-Judaism uh, and his view of the Jewish God as an insatiable moloch that demands human sacrifice, just as in his Christian form, he had demanded the crucifixion of his own son. I mean, in other words, I mean, Hess signed up to the anti-Semitic blood libel. A second one who I've already mentioned is Leo Pinsker, who founded the uh, Hub of Zion, the Lovers of Zionism. And that was directly as a result of the 1881 pogroms in Odessa and other places in the Polar Settlement. This was after the assassination of Tsar Alexander II. There were mass pogroms in Russia. And many of those Jews who had signed up to Haskalah, the Jewish emancipation, then turned to Zionism. Uh, certainly the intellectual uh, elite did. But the major figure uh, was Theodor Herzl. He wrote a pamphlet, The Jewish State in 1895. And in 1897, he called the first World Zionist Congress. Herzl was a Viennese journalist. He worked on the New Free Press in Vienna, but he was a reporter in Paris. Uh, Herzl was a uh, a strange person in many ways. He certainly wasn't religious. He didn't even circumcise his own son. Uh, his first solution to the Jewish question, uh, because in Vienna, uh, the, the anti-Semites, uh, Karl Luger, had actually gained the mayorship of Vienna, uh, despite the wishes of uh, the Austrian Empire. But Herzl's first solution was to con that the Jews should convert to Catholicism. But quickly realizing this was not practical, he then embarked on a Zionist solution. The idea that an alliance with imperialist powers, one or other, and he spent most of his time journeying across Europe, meeting with different uh, imperialists and different 
aristocrat in an effort to win support for uh, his proposed Jewish state in Palestine. The problem for Herzl, of course, he was too early. The resolution of uh, the Ottoman Empire, the sick man of Europe, was to await the First World War. Herzl died in 1904, uh, and therefore he wasn't able to realize his dreams. But he met the Pope, he met the Ottoman Sultan, he met the German Kaiser, he met with uh, Joseph Chamberlain, the British Foreign Minister when he came over here, uh, and he met with many, uh, many others, uh, the Italian uh, Prime Minister and so on. Uh, and his desire was to, to obtain a charter from one or other of these imperialist powers, which would enable legal colonization of Palestine. Uh, and if I had time, which I hadn't, I would be able to go into uh, the differences within the Zionist movement between those who were practical Zionists, who believed in getting on with colonization there and now, and those who believed you, you had to wait until you had an agreement with one or other imperialist powers. But what was the reaction of Jews to Zionism? Well, of course, if you listen to people like Ephraim Mervis now, then uh, Zionism was welcomed with open arms, but this simply wasn't true. The first Zionist Congress in 1897 was supposed to have been held in Munich, in Bavaria. But the Jewish population, led by its rabbis, rose up uh, in protest. They accused the authorities of anti-Semitism for even allowing uh, the Zionist Congress to meet. Remember, Zionism posited that the only solution to the Jewish question and anti-Semitism was the self-repatriation of the Jews themselves. In other words, exactly what the anti-Semites wanted. So the first Zionist Congress had to be resituated in Baal in Switzerland. Uh, and this was typical. I mean, if you go up to 1933, uh, when Hitler took power, just 2% of German Jews subscribed to the then Ger German Zionist Federation. So the, this gives you an understanding of the popularity of Zionism amongst Jews before the Holocaust. In Britain, Lucien Wolfe, who was secretary of the Conjoint Foreign Committee of uh, the Board of Deputies, uh, was quite clear. He said, I've spoke, spent most of my life, he said, and I'm quoting, I spent most of my life in combating these very doctrines when presented to me in the form of anti-Semitism. And I can only regard them as the more dangerous when they come to me in the guise of Zionism. They constitute a capitulation to our enemies. And this was the idea that Jews were a separate nation from those amongst whom they lived. That's what the anti-Semites said. That's what the Zionists said. And as I've already mentioned, some of the most vehement opponents uh, were Orthodox Jews, but not just Orthodox Jews, socialists also, because the Zionists said you couldn't fight anti-Semitism, you had to escape from it, where socialist and communist Jews said we fight where we are, here in us. Uh, the band uh, was particularly uh, fond of this concept, that we fight where we are. The band was the General Jewish Workers' Union, of Russia, Poland, and Lithuania was the mass movement of Jewish workers uh, before, uh, before 1939. And in fact, in 1938 in Poland, the last three elections in Warsaw, out of 20 Jewish council seats, the Bund, which was anti-Zionist, won 17, and the Zionists won exactly one. Uh, and that was reflected throughout Poland. So the idea that somehow Zionism swept all before it is simply a myth. Indeed, in Poland, where half of Europe's Jews live, 3.3 uh, three, well, 3 .3 million, uh, well, certainly half of those who were exterminated in the Holocaust. Zionism was extremely unpopular because it offered no solutions into it at all. And Geoffrey Alderman, who's the historian of British uh, Jewry, uh, in his book, British uh, Jewish Community and British Politics, said of support for Zionism, that it could have serious electoral drawbacks in the East End of the 1930s. Being a Zionist was not an advantage. And in 1906, in the Manchester East constituency, Arthur Balfour, the prime minister, lost his seat in the Jewish constituency to the liberals, despite his cultivation of the Zionist movement. And Alderman says this was a telling ver verdict upon Zionist political influence at the time. Now, I mean, the reaction of the bourgeois Jews uh, was also very interesting. The, the chief rabbi uh, was uh, called Herman Adler. He was a thoroughly reactionary rogue. 
but he was certainly opposed to Zionism. He saw Zionism as having no relationship to the Jewish religion. Adler was also vehemently opposed to the immigration of Russian Jews. He called them criminals, mentally and physically afflicted. Uh, and that was the attitude of most of the British Jewish bourgeoisie. So the idea that Jews form one nation together, you know, again, is a nonsense. And, and it has to be said of the bourgeois Jews, that they, they were vehemently opposed to Zionism, which they saw as undermining their own status. And indeed, uh, in the wake of the Balfour Declaration of 1917, which promised the land of Palestine to the Zionists over the head of the Palestinians, the League of British Jews was formed at a meeting in New Court, which was the headquarters of the Rothschilds' business interests. Its first in AGM in March 2018 was attended by over 400 members. Lionel Rothschild was elected president, and Lord Swatheling, Samuel Montague, former MP, as vice president. And maybe we should take a break and just think that Today, when we often have Rothschilds tropes, that the Rothschilds created Israel, the Rothschilds are behind uh, the Zionist movement, etc. In fact, a substantial branch of the Rothschilds family was always anti-Zionist. This is what anti-Semites never seem to grasp, that uh, there was no uh, homogene homogeneity uh, amongst Jews or the Rothschilds or any other branch. Uh, of Jews. The Times uh, of 13th of March uh, to, uh, 1918, not 2018 of course, reported that all the leading names of Anglo Jewry are represented on its provisional committee. It even set up a rival paper, newspaper, the Jewish Chronicle, the Jewish Guardian. In 1920, over Zionist objections, the Board of Deputies accepted Lord Rothschild's recommendations to cooperate with the League in combating anti-Semitism. In fact, it can be said that Jewish bourgeoisie in Britain only adopted Zionism reluctantly because the British bourgeoisie had decided it was in its interest to do so. In other words, they had to fall into line with the English British bourgeoisie. Uh, they were certainly not enthusiastic uh, about it. I've probably gone on far too long now. Uh, and, and so really, I, will wind, I, I wish to wind up and, and say that Zionism is not the movement of Jewish people. It is now and it never has been. But I think what we are seeing now is a greater and growing Jewish resistance to it, not least in America itself. But of course, we will find the Zionist zealots devotedly trying to attack any criticism of Zionism as anti-Semitism because they make that equation between being Jewish and being a Zionist. Uh, I'll leave it at there because I, I've probably gone on far too long as it is. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Tony. Uh, some uh, very, uh, very stimulating ideas there on the history of uh, Zionism. Um, I've uh, seen one hand up uh, so far, which is uh, Matthew Dale. So, Matthew, if you'd uh, like to come in, please. Matthew Dale. Kevin, there's also a question from Tony Greenstein in the Q&A. <laughs> okay. yeah. To come be on. honest, yeah, yeah. Um, my, my hand actually wasn't up, Kevin. Something happened. I rejoined the meeting and got put up the top here. So. <laughs> okay, Matthew, sorry okay. about that. Thank you, okay, Tony. Uh, it's very interesting. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, Steve O'Neill, I think, has um, got his hand up. Steve O'Neill. <clears throat> Why don't you read the question? Hi there. Kevin. Yeah, oh. okay. yeah, back in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, 2016, um, I, I'd been living in uh, Brussels for 16 years and I came over here and joined the Labour Party as soon as I could. And sometime after that, I was at uh, Nero's having a cappuccino and I was reading my device. And uh, I saw that some guy named Tony Greenstein had been ejected from the Labour Party for anti-Semitism. And uh, I got thinking about this and I had to see some friends, some other friends in the Labour Party. And I went to their home and I said, um, I've just been reading that there's a guy named Tony Greenstein and he's been uh, kicked out of the Labour Party anti-Semitism you know I didn't get it 
And um, sorry, I'm just starting my video. Sorry about that. But um, anyway, I, I made the fatal mistake of using logic. You know, you should never use logic with this issue. And um, my other question is, <clears throat> or my question is, isn't the overall strategy of the Zionists to um, to attach themselves to any government that has any influence in the Middle East to try to sway them uh, for their purposes, you know, like uh, the, the Ottoman Empire, for example, they did that. And I think uh, the Third Reich for a little while. So if that is the case, uh, it certainly succeeded um, as far as the, the U.S. is concerned with their APAC and what have you. And um, the, the Zionists in America are mainly Christians, I understand, and they're also even more influential. So, you know, am I right in, in, in saying this, that, you know, the idea is to heavily influence any government that has any sway over the Middle East? So, thank you. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, there is a question in the question and answer, um, and it says, um, it's, uh, it asks you, Tony, why do you think that the leaders of the Palestine uh, Solidarity Campaign fail to condemn or even discuss Zionism? And that question comes from Tony Greenstein, but I suspect it's not you, Tony. <laughs> okay. Um, there's nobody. There's nobody in the uh, in the chat at the moment. But uh, a question I'd like uh, to ask you, Tony, and it's uh, it's really about the historical question, and it's um, it's about the sort of um, invention of uh, a particular sort of idea of Jewishness. And I'm thinking particularly of the debates, say, around the time of the Enlightenment, and. Um, you know, the, the idea of Jewish emancipation. And you, you mention um, you, you mention some Jewish people who are involved in, you know, calling for an emancipation. But I wondered if, um, if there are any uh, origins of, um, of Zionism, the idea of a, a distinctive Jewish nation with a territory in that, in that period. And then secondly, um, it's about really, I suppose, the other, the other role of Jewish intellectuals who locate their emancipation, not in their own specific emancipation as a people, but actually, and see themselves as part of wider emancipation. Because one of the interesting things I think often for groups who are persecuted and oppressed is that they often see their oppression as part of wider oppression. And so they recognize that it's only when the general oppression is dealt with that their own specific um, oppression you know, can, be, can be dealt with. In other words, it's, it's the idea of the universal. And of course, a, you know, the, the relationship between the universal and the particular is very important in the enlightenment. And uh, I remember in a, I think it was a Jewish museum in Prague where I saw some references to those debates going on in the 18th and the 19th century. I think, um, I think Mendelssohn, uh, not, not the composer, but uh, an earlier Mendelssohn uh, was, um, you know, was, was arguing and, and, and talking this way. And I'm quite interested in this idea because um, I, I think that it's, it's a sort of tradition that um, you know, is often overlooked, or at least in terms of the, the, the popular presentation so I wonder if you could comment on that. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the comrade, it was uh, somebody called Jack T who uh, asked the question about the Palestine solidarity uh, campaign, Tony. Okay, uh, any further uh, questions? It's Terry Galogrino. Okay, so, um, okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's one from uh, Mary Dwyer. And it was uh, one that came in earlier, and I think you did touch on it, Tony. But Mary says, um, how can a religion be a race? And uh, that's quite an interesting question in terms of defining 
uh, a nationality, but also the relationship between race and, and nationality. Oh, okay, right. uh, Terry, would you like to uh, would you like to come in, please now? Sorry, Chair. It's the same thing with me. I was rejoining the meeting, and somehow <laughs> that must have clicked the hand up. But I wasn't about to ask a question. But I very much enjoyed uh, Tony's presentation. I'd like to say that. Okay, thanks, Terry. <laughs> well, at least you're not called Tony Greenstein, so that's one thing. Um, uh, Tony, would you like to just respond to some of the questions and comments uh, so far? If that's, yeah, uh, I've also taken one uh, off the chat as well. Uh, how did not European anti Semites also see Arabs as anti Semites? Yeah. So I, I'll take that one uh, as well. Uh, I'll start at the beginning. Uh, yes, I, I was, uh, I think, the first Jewish person to be expelled from the Labour Party, though not the last person. I mean, uh, today, uh, the chances of you being uh, suspended or expelled if you're Jewish are quite high. Because, of course, uh, today, I mean, it, they make no pretense about it. If you criticise Israel, then that is anti-Semitic. Uh, uh, so they've chilled free speech on Palestine and unfortunately Jeremy Corbyn went along with it when he supported the IHRA originally. Uh, in fact, uh, neither me or Jackie Walker or Mark Wadgwood, we were suspended as part of the anti-Semitism campaign. But when it came down to it, we weren't accused of anti-Semitism. They always found another pretext, bringing the party into disrepute, abusing people, uh, whatever. I mean, uh, they, they found pretext, but they weren't anti-Semitism because, of course, they, they found it impossible to define it anyway. And it wasn't about anti-Semitism. As regards uh, America and the Christian Zionists, uh, yes, uh, you're absolutely right. The most ardent Zionists in America are not Jewish. They're Christians who believe that uh, they will not achieve rapture, the ascent to heaven, uh, the second coming, uh, unless the Jews return to uh, Palestine, Israel. I mean, these same people, of course, are in themselves uh, often virulently anti-Semitic. Uh, I mean, no, no better example than Donald Trump, who was the most pro-Zionist US president has ever been. Uh, he repeatedly said to American Jews, uh, he called them out for being disloyal for criticizing Israel. And the reason why they were disloyal was because, again, in his words, Israel was their real home. Uh, which is the Zionist belief that uh, Jews in the diaspora don't really belong there. They belong back in Israel as part of the racial collective. Uh, so, uh, and the best example is the president of the of Christian United uh, Christians United for Israel, which is I think 1.4 million strong. John Haji, uh, who in one of his sermons, and it's on my blog somewhere. Uh, spoke of Hitler as being God's messenger sent to drive the Jews to Palestine. Uh, make of that what you will. Uh, but if Hitler was the agent of God, then it says something about Christian uh, fundamentalist theology. Uh, and indeed, uh, the whole rapture business, uh, it, and you find it in Revelations, it envisages the battles on the, uh, the Battle of Armageddon and so on, in which two thirds of the Jewish people will die and one third will be saved to convert to Christianity and ascend to heaven. So, I mean, it, it's completely anti Semitic uh, theology to begin with, but uh, it's also a pro Zionist one. PSC, well, I mean, a Palestine Solidarity Campaign. I think the reason uh, for the fa fact that they're not anti-Zionist uh, and have no critique of the Israeli state beyond calling it apartheid, but they, uh, it doesn't go beyond there, is simply that they, uh, they wish to deal with the powers that be as they exist. They don't want to offend any uh, supporters of Israel who might also be supporters of Palestinians. So they relegate their interest in, in Palestine and essentially to questions of human rights. So, for example, they have never come out against a two-state solution, which is an apartheid solution, uh, and which is recognized widely today. Uh, and that's why they have a disgraceful attitude over defending David Miller, because he critiqued uh, 
the Zionist movement and the Zionist structures. The idea that somehow Zionism organizes itself automatically, and if you criticize it, you're falling into an anti-Semitic trope or uh, critique uh, is quite absurd. But PSC, for example, I mean, it has the majority of trade unions affiliated, but on the basis of the lowest common denominator, namely tacit support for the existing two-state uh, support that they have. So what two-statism means, in essence, is you can support uh, the Palestinians on a human rights basis, but you support the Israeli state on a political basis, and PSC simply will not challenge that, which is why it was so ineffectual during the anti-Semitism campaign, because it had nothing to say on, an on anti-Semitism and how the Zionists had been weaponizing it against supporters of the Palestinians. Uh, so they were completely kept adrift. I mean, I, I say I could continue uh, ad infinitum on this, but uh, I think it probably is slightly distracting detracting from the topic uh, of, the que uh, of uh, this particular talk. Regarding Kevin's point, uh, undoubtedly, uh, I mean, first one has to understand that in the 19th century Europe, Eastern Europe, which is where the anti-Semitism occurred, there were also occurring massive changes in the composition of the Jewish community from becoming traders, from uh, having specialized occupations and so on, to becoming, in a sense, pauperized and proletarianized, except that Jewish workers were often working for Jewish bosses in very, very small workshops. So their, their ability to uh, affect any uh, power, as it were, uh, was quite limited. But there were massive debates. I mean, Zionism, of course, if, in times of weakness and times of despair, when Jews looked to messianic solutions. I mean, in the, the 18th century, there's someone called Shabtai Tzvi, the false messiah, who promised to lead the Jews out of Europe into uh, Palestine. I mean, these episodes occur when people are despairing uh, of anything else, their lot is particularly bad. Uh, they retreat into the realm of fantasy. I mean, you saw that with the development in the 18th century of Hasidim, a particular variant of the Jewish religion. Uh, I mean, the return to religion is in itself often a sign of people's despair, that they, the despair of their own power. So these debates were taking place uh, in 19th century uh, Russia uh, as the pogroms uh, were increasing. Uh, and you saw the formation at the end of the 19th century uh, of the, the Bund, but it had been, there had been Jewish socialist formation before the Bund uh, came together in 1897 in Vilna. And the, clearly the, the, there were many debates. The Zionist solution, of course, was you couldn't ally with anyone. All the Jews, uh, non-Jews, were enemies. And the only solution was to leave. But Jewish socialists, and don't forget, I mean, uh, one of the reasons that the Tsarist regime hated the Jews so much was because they saw them as a... Uh, the main revolutionary enemy. Some 50% of those who were arrested in Soros Russia for revolutionary activities were Jewish. Uh, the Jews took a very, very full part, as we know, people like Trotsky, of course, and Kamenev and others uh, in the revolutionary movement, in the Bolsheviks. Uh, and the Zionists themselves, I mean, the socialist Zionists, Paul Zion, it, it in essence uh, collapsed into the Bolsheviks. Uh, because it was clear that the solution to Palestine was not a solution, it was a mirage. Uh, it, 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 it had no hold on people. So, I mean, there were these debates. I mean, Zionism basically says that you can't, you can't achieve anything where you are, whereas socialism uh, says, on the contrary, that uh, anti-Semitism stems, in essence, from the attempt of the ruling class to divide and rule. And there was no doubt that the pogroms in Russia, the most infamous of which was Kishinev in uh, 1903, uh, was directly organized uh, by the Tsarist autocracy via a group called the Black Hundreds. Uh, Russian soldiers were ordered to stay clear and only intervene when the Jews tried to defend themselves. So anti-Semitism was uh, one of the principal weapons uh, of the Tsarist regime. Uh, and that's why the Bolsheviks adopted such a, a harsh attitude to pogromists and shot quite a number of them and outlawed anti-Semitism. Uh, 
uh, because anti-Semitism has always been the handmaiden of Zionism. They've gone hand in hand. Zionism has never, I mean, this is the subject of another talk, so I won't dwell on it, but Zionism never had any objection to anti-Semitism per se. And in fact, in 1903, uh, Herzl, uh, barely four months after uh, the Kishinev pogrom, journeyed to, uh, to Russia and met with uh, von Plev, the Tsarist interior minister, who had been personally responsible for organizing the pogroms. And Herzl parleyed with him. He, he firstly got Plev to agree that the Zionist movement, uniquely amongst political movements, was legalized in Tsarist Russia, whereas, of course, the Bund, uh, the Social Democrats and so on, were illegal. And he promised uh, the Tsar that if they got a charter in 15 years, the Jews would keep quiet. And of course, the reaction of most Jews to this was a, one of outrage. Uh, even his fellow Zionists thought he'd taken leave of the census. So uh, that was uh, the Zionist attitude. Zionism is particularist. It ha doesn't see anything in universal terms, it, it, but it believes in Jewish exceptionalism, uh, that Jews are the chosen race and it politicizes what was a, a, a biblical concept. Uh, Zionism does not believe in the unity of the working class. And the fact that the Labour Party adopted Paul Zion in 1920 and allowed it to affiliate was precisely because of the Labour Party's support for the, the empire and support actually for settled colonialism, both in South Africa and uh, Palestine. The question, next question, how can a religion be erased? Well, the answer is it can't be erased, of course. Uh, but that doesn't stop some people trying to form nations and states on the basis of religion, ethno-religious states. Uh, you saw that uh, in Europe in the 1930s, uh, a whole series of Christian states, which were also the most virulently anti-Semitic, Hungary, Romania, uh, Croatia, the Nazi puppet state, the only state incidentally to have an extermination camp, Yasenovac, outside uh, of the Nazi orbit. Uh, most of the Nazi extermination camps were in Poland, uh, but Yasenovic, which was mainly for Serbs, not Jews, though many Jews did die in it, uh, was established by the Croatian Yastashi regime, which saw itself as a Christian uh, uh, above all. Uh, Slovakia, the, uh, another Christian state headed by a Catholic priest, Father Tiso. Uh, it was the first state in March uh, 1942 uh, to deport its Jews. Uh, and again, I mean, where you have a state which bases itself on a religion and defines its, its citizens and its nationals in terms of religion, and that state is inherently and almost automatically racist because it says everyone else who's not of that religion is the other, is outside the national collective. And of course, that's exactly what happens in Israel. It's a Jewish state, therefore non-Jews don't belong to that national collective. Uh, so of course, uh, a religion can't, but the whole point of Zionism, it sought to transform the Jews from being a people who had religion in common to becoming a nation stroke race in Palestine. Uh, it was a form of collective, they said, assimilation, but uh, instead of assimilation to the non-Jews, the Jews would become like all others. Palestine, or it, what became Israel, would be as Jewish as England as English, said Chaim Weizmann. Uh, but of course, uh, no allowance is made for the fact the majority of the existing population were not Jewish. Semites. Well, the guy who coined the term anti-Semites uh, was a guy called Wilhelm Marr who wrote a pamphlet in 1879, The Victory of Germanism Over Judaism. Uh, I, I'm quoting uh, off the top of my head, so it, it, it may not be exact. But he popularized the term anti-Semite because he held that the Jews of Europe weren't from Europe. They were in fact from the Middle East and they were Semites. Semite itself refers to language. It's a li linguistic definition. It has nothing to do with people but he racialized the Jewish question. He had no time for religious critiques of, Jew, uh, of the Jews. For him, it was a question of race. And it, so it didn't matter if Jews converted, they were still part of that same race. And that was the essential difference between feudal Christian antisemitism and racial antisemitism, because however many times you convert a Jew, a Jew would be a Jew. 
uh, and that was the basis of anti-Semitism. So anti-Semitism today is just a word for anti-Jewish racism. It has no inherent meaning, and the term Semite uh, is a complete irrelevance. It was based on an abstraction. Ironically, Arthur Rupin, who was probably the most important Zionist in Palestine before uh, the establishment of the Israeli state, apart from Ben-Gurion himself, had a different thesis, which was the Jews of Europe were Aryans. Uh, they weren't Semites. And therefore he didn't want the Arab Jews to come to uh, what became Israel because they were of a lower quality. They were racially inferior. And he had a, a pathological hatred of them, in fact. The Yemenite Jews were brought into Palestine to do the heavy work in the early Zionist colonies, were treated really just like the Arabs. They were denied medical care. They were given starvation rations and something like 50% of them died as a result. Uh, this is a, another untold story of Zionism towards the Oriental Jews because Zionism was, uh, and is today, I mean, it, it, it's, it still discriminates against Oriental and Black Jews, but uh, of course uh, they're part of the racial hierarchy because Israel has its own racial hierarchy. Right, any more questions? I see there is a number in the question and answer. Different between liberal Zionists. Yeah, um, I think if you would like to go through the question and answer box, uh, Tony, I can see that some of them will really relate to things you're going to be talking about in later sessions, but there's probably no harm um, yeah. in dealing with it now. And then I think uh, if you could just look at them, I, I think uh, Pam Blakelock wanted to uh, come in to speak. Yes, OK, fine. Well, I've got a number of questions here. Can I speak to, speak a little about the difference between liberal Zionists? Well, I'll just I'll just bring in uh, Pam Blakelock. Yeah, and then fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, Pam. It's in just two plum. Oh, so yeah, it was a question about Arab nationalism and uh, the Ottomans. Um, I think we're all familiar with. Uh, the deal between Britain and France and the betrayal of the Arab nationalist aspirations, for instance, in Iraq, et cetera, and how was it the Sykes-Picot uh, secret agreement? But what was happening in Palestine as such in relation to all that? That was, that was my first question. And then my second question, which you may want to deal with later, is about how to fight this so-called left anti-Semitism slur. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, are there any further comrades who uh, want to come in and make a contribution? Uh, so say we've got a number of uh, questions in the question box, but it's always better to come in and talk if you can. Uh, but I mean, Tony does need a bit of a rest. <laughs> I'm sure he's quite willing to talk for a few hours, but uh, okay, um, just a comrade there. Uh, James Hall, if you'd like to come in, please, James. Unmute, I think he needs to. Yeah. Can't okay. hear you, James. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 Uh, Tony preempted one of my questions, really, which was a question of um, uh, a color based, I suppose, uh, racial hierarchy within the Israeli Jews. Uh, but could he explain, quite having talked about uh, an essential Zionist myth of the uh, Jewish race, how they actually can account for uh, this? What do you mean exactly by that account for it? Could you repeat that, Tony? Sorry. Yeah, I didn't quite understand. When you say how do they account for it, what do you mean? How do they explain their belief in the Jewish race? That's what you mean. No, that that uh, to uh, maintain a myth of a Jewish race would require some sort of uh, homogeneity uh, across all Jews, whereas plainly uh, colour-based uh, hierarchy within Israel uh, suggests otherwise. I'm wondering if there is any explanation from the Zionists from this, or is it 
just quietly ignored. Okay. Do I take those two, three? No, well, just, just a second, Tony. I've got a couple of questions that have come in on the chat box. So I'll read them out so people can, uh, can hear them. This one's from Paul Fletcher. And he asks, um, he says, could Tony talk a little bit about the difference between liberal Zionists, such as Einstein, uh, Martin Buber, Hannah Arendt, and their, their, critic, uh, their critics of political Zionism, um, such as uh, Begin of the Freedom Party. I'm not quite sure, that's, I'm reading that out. I'm not quite sure where uh, Paul's driving at, but I think he's asking you to talk a little more about liberal Zionism. Uh, again, I know this is part of the later talks, but it's, it's being asked now. Um, this one is for, from Felicity de Motta, who says, uh, could you um, explain why many socialists and on the left still maintain that Ken Livingstone was wrong when history shows the opposite? And I think that's about the relationship between Zionism and the Nazis in the 1930s. Um, and then um, another one from Jack T says, um, the Board of Deputies claim that 90% of British Jews support Zionism. Now, if this is the case, is there any possibility of getting them to see the racism uh, that's inherent in Zionism? So, okay. Um, uh, a question from Michael Craig. And he says, uh, I'm still confused, a, a, a bit confused about identity. Yeah, I think there are a lot of us like that, Michael. Um, he says, I'm an atheist descended from Protestants. I identify as an atheist. Why do atheists who are descended from Jews call themselves Jews? And this, I think, goes back to this relationship between identity, race, nation, and religion, uh, you know, the, the, the conflation of these terms. Okay, um, it's, it's a, another question from uh, Diana Isalis, and Diana says, um, is it correct to assume that Ashkenazi Jews have never had any connection with Palestine or the Middle East? And are the majority of Jews in Britain, particularly those who settled in the East End of London after fleeing Russia and the Eastern Ukraine, uh, Ashkenazi? So uh, those are some of the uh, questions. Uh, I'll just uh, just ask uh, comrades to uh, if you want to um, if you want to ask questions, please. If you could uh, just raise your hands. Uh, we've still got a little bit of time left, and uh, so um, I, I'm sure you can come in and ask them. Um, so uh, if Tony, you'd like to uh, to respond, and then we'll take one more round of questions and then sum up for the evening. Okay, uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to go on longer if you want. Uh, I don't mind answering all the questions. Left anti-Semitism. Well, oh, this was the con This is really the idea that if you're opposed to Zionism in Israel, that you are anti-Semitic. It, it's a redefinition of the term anti-Semitism. So instead of anti-Semitism being about hating or being hostile to Jews, it's about being hated, hating or being hostile to Israel, and you hate Israel and what it does, or rather you hate Israel, not because of what it does, but because it's a Jewish state. It is the Jew amongst the nations, as Erwin Kotler, the, a former Canadian Minister of Justice put it. Uh, it's of course an absolute nonsense. It was run with and popularized by the Alliance for Workers' Liberty, an ex-Trotskyist group, which joined the right in the witch hunt in the Labour Party. Uh, but it, it, it's an absolute nonsense because, of course, most people understand what anti Semitism is. Anti Semitism is if you don't like me because I'm Jewish. That, that, that really is it. If you ask the man on the club omnibus what is anti Semitism, he'll tell you that he's the reasonable person in, in British law. Uh, he'll say it's someone who doesn't like Jews. But the Zionists have tried to say it's someone who doesn't like Israel. And groups like the Campaign Against Antisemitism have tried to redefine antisemitism in such a way as they now say the majority of anti-Semites in Britain are on the left rather than the right. It's a conjuring trick. It's a completely dishonest, of course, uh, because your attitude to Israel has nothing to do with what your attitude 
to being Jewish is. Of course, there are a small number of people who will conflate being Jewish and is or will hate uh, or dislike the, the Israeli state because it's a Jewish state. Uh, but they're, they're few and far between. I mean, these days, most fascists, most anti-Semites will have Israel, but they don't like Jews. So I, I hope I've dealt with that one. Uh, how do you maintain the myth that Jews are a race? Uh, or how do the Zionists do that? Well, firstly, most Zionists today won't say that Jews are a race. But in reality, that is exactly what they are saying. And certainly in Israel, you'll find uh, people much, much more honest and open about the fact that they consider the Jews to be a race, a separate race uh, from all others. How do they do that? Because it, in a state which is based on racial supremacy, it's not very difficult to racialize these things and to see yourself as superior. And in that sense, you're racially superior. Uh, the other next question is a very interesting one, uh, but I don't think I have time to deal with it adequately which is about liberal Zionism. Firstly, it's arguable whether all three of those, the people mentioned, Einstein, Hannah Arendt and Martin Buber were liberal Zionists. Certainly Buber was, uh, although he held to the myths of blood and uh, soil uh, in Palestine. Einstein moved away from Zionism. He moved away from political Zionism and he was opposed to having a Jewish state. He thought it was un-Jewish uh, and he actually he gave evidence at the UN Special Committee on Palestine in 1946, an inquiry set up, as say, by the United Nations to look into the whole Palestine situation. And Einstein was very clear that he thought that if the Jewish state was formed, it would be a racist and a nationalist state, and it would contradict everything that Judaism had historically uh, uh, fought for. Uh, and him and Hannah Arendt, who is probably the most famous uh, political philosopher of the 20th century, she wrote uh, things like Origins of Totalitarianism. I recommend The Jewish Pariah. It's a book. It's really a very good book. Uh, and Eichmann in Jerusalem, which is the best book on uh, the Eichmann trial. And she was so hated by the Zionists for it, they never, ever forgave her. They attacked her vehemently, including as a Holocaust denier and all sorts of things. Uh, Hannah Arendt was a complex character. Uh, someone who I'm extremely fond of, although I disagree with many of the things she did and said. She was, like Einstein, was in her youth, she was a Zionist, but she moved away from Zionism because she was a universalist. And that was what the Zionists hated about both her and also Einstein, or they couldn't say it about Einstein openly. Uh, Hannah Arendt was accused after writing uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, she was accused by Gershom Sholem, who was a kind of professor of mysticism, Jewish mysticism at the Hebrew University. She was accused of having no, no Ahavat Yisrael. In other words, she didn't have a love of Israel. Uh, and in quite a devastating reply, she said, Gershom, you're, you are correct. I do not love Israel. I do not love a whole people. I love my friends and my, fr my family but I can't love a whole people. Uh, and that really summed it up uh, as to the difference between the racism of Zionism, which says you love your whole people, but you love no one else. Uh, and someone who was a universalist who believed that uh, you couldn't simply divide people into racial or religious categories. Uh, Hannah Arendt wrote a very key essay, Zionism Reconsidered. And although she occasionally went back and flirted with Zionism, she was, a, I think, a classical non-Zionist. Uh, as was Einstein himself. Uh, Buber was a different category, but the point about liberal Zionism, I mean, there was a cultural Zionism represented by someone called Asher Ginsburg, Eichard Ha'am, who warned about establishing a political center, but they were very, very marginal. And when you talk about liberal Zionism, well, <laughs> it wears many, uh, many badges and many coats, as it were. It's uh, it's an ephemeral uh, current, as it were. You can't really uh, define it. In the West, liberal Zionism has often collapsed into mainstream Zionism and has become very little different from it. Uh, but today, I mean, there are signs that some on the liberal Zionist wing are reconsidering their position. The most prominent of these is a guy called Peter Baynard, who is uh, 
the editor-in-chief of Jewish Currents in the United States, who has come out explicitly now against the Jewish state. He realizes that two states are no longer an option, not to what I believe they ever were. But today uh, he ha has come out against the Jewish state and in favor of a, a binational state. Uh, and he's been, of course, attacked uh, as an anti-Semite and a traitor and everything else, because that's the only language that Zionism and the Zionists understand. Uh, but liberal Zionism itself has never been a strong current. And uh, it, it's, of course, no surprise that the logic today is that uh, Zionism in Israel is going further and further to the nationalist right. And we've seen the election of two, at least two Jewish Nazis uh, to the Knesset. And I use the term quite deliberately as well. Uh, where people who believe in criminalizing sexual relations between Jews and non-Jews, and that is classic Nazi racism. Uh, Ken Livingston, well, I'm doing a talk on this topic, so I'm not going to go into this in much detail, but you're right, of course. Uh, the Zionist attitude to the Nazis was no different from the historical and traditional uh, attitude to anti-Semitism, uh, and therefore there were close relations. Of course, the Nazis had the had all the power. The Zionists didn't have any power, so one should never misunderstand the relationship as being a relation, relation of equals, because it wasn't, it clearly wasn't. But the Zionists were the favourite Jews of the Nazis, and the Nazis made that very, very clear to people. Uh, but why was Livingston uh, attacked in the way he was? Because it's a very, very sore topic, in the same way as Ken Roach was recently subject to attack. Uh, over his uh, talk at St. Peter's College, Oxford. The Zionists do not want people to look at the actual record that they had during the Nazi era because it was such an atrocious one. I, I'd say I'm, I'm writing a book on this, so I, I won't go into it any further given that I have a talk on this uh, as part of this series. Uh, Jewish atheists, how do we reconcile the difference? Good question, good question. Uh, I'll, t I'll say I'll say this. Uh, how do you define yourself as Jewish? Well, of course, if you're religious, you define yourself by the religion. If you're a nationalist, you define yourself politically in terms of Zionism. So how do I define myself as Jewish? I'm not religious. I'm an atheist, uh, although my father was a rabbi. Uh, I define myself politically, primarily, but to some extent culturally, but politically. Uh, as a, uh, an anti-Zionist. So I define myself in opposition to Zionism. So it's a political definition. Why? Because Zionism claims that it represents all Jews in the crimes that it commits. And I think it's incumbent upon Jews who do not support Zionism to come out clearly and say they don't support Zionism and that they are anti-Zionist. So that's my personal uh, explanation. 90%, uh, someone quoted the, fig the Board of Deputies claim that 90% of British Jews are Zionists. That's simply not true. In the last authoritative opinion survey, and you can look it up, uh, British Jewry's attitude to, uh, to Israel, uh, it was commissioned by Yahad, and it was, uh, the research was done by City University. This question was asked, do you consider yourself a Zionist? 58% said yes. 31% said no, and I think 10% didn't know. That was a change. Five years previously in 2010, 72% had said they were a Zionist. So there's a drop of something like 13% in the number of Jews in Britain who said they were a Zionist. So if people say they're not a Zionist, I'm not going to contradict them. The true figure is about 60%, according to the last authoritative academic study, not 90%. Of course, Many Jews identify with Israel, that, which was a separate question, but that didn't therefore mean they were Zionists. People may identify with Israel because their families there and their relations. And I could say the same as well. I identify with Israel, but in what way I identify is a different question altogether. So, no, that's simply wrong, but it's part of their propaganda. Uh, Ashkenazis, well, yes, the majority, the majority of Jews who came, in fact, all of the Jews who came from Russia uh, and Poland uh, to London, mainly in the late 19th and beginning of the 20th century, were Ashkenazi Jews. There was a fairly prosperous bourgeois Jewish community in Britain already, 
and from my understanding, they were mainly Sephardic Jews, Jews who came from Spain and Portugal and so on. So there were those differences. Uh, and those differences pertain in Israel today. I mean, the Ashkenazi are really the ruling class. And although there are rich uh, Sephardi Jews, the Jews from the Arab countries formed the basis of uh, Menachem Begin's victory in 1977, when the Israeli Labour Party was turfed out of government. Precisely, actually, because of their racism towards Oriental Jewry. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Has anyone got any further questions? Or yeah, uh, Tony. Yeah, um, Paul Fletcher. Paul Fletcher's got his hand up. Certainly. Right. I can't see him. Paul Fletcher. Has he been brought into the onto the panel to ask the question or not? No, oh, I'm not, I'm not controlling the panel at the moment. All oh, right, okay. All right. Yeah, Paul Fletcher has his hand up. Well, shall I answer two other questions? Well, yes, yes, if you would please, uh, Tony. Yeah, uh, Diana is service. I don't think I answered her question fully. Is it correct to assume? Ashkenazi Jews have never had any connection with Palestine uh, or the Middle East. Uh, are the majority of Jews in Britain uh, Ashkenazi, those who fled Russia? Well, the answer to the latter one I have answered, and the answer is yes. Uh, yes, in essence, we, we don't know where Ashkenazi Jews came from, but predominantly they were probably the product of uh, conversion from non Jews. I mean, there's a theory about the Kingdom of Khazar, which Borders, I think, uh, bordered, I think, the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. But uh, it is, in a sense, an irrelevance because when people, even if there was a, a link going back 2,000 years to Palestine, I mean, it is really irrelevant now. But it, I think we are correct to say that Ashkenazi Jews have no direct link uh, and never have had a direct link with Palestine. Ironically, uh, and the early Zionists, Ben Gurion and Yitzhak Ben Sevi, who was the second Israeli president, they accepted that the, if you like, the, the direct descendants of the Palestinian Jews uh, are uh, living under the Roman Empire uh, are the Palestinians. They're, they're, they're the most obvious descendants, and there's there's a lot of evidence for this in terms of some of the rituals uh, that they themselves have practiced, which have a marked similarity to Jewish religious rituals. So uh, th this, is, uh, this is the irony of the situation. If anyone uh, is descended from the, the original Jews in Palestine, it is the Palestinians, not, not the European settlers and Camus Jews. Uh, Nicholas Davis has asked a, a good question. Doesn't the current government of India also conflate Hinduism with Hindus as a race, much the same as Zionists do? And the answer to that is absolutely yes, yes. Uh, it's no accident that Narendra Modi, uh, Modi uh, the Prime Minister uh, of India, who's uh, a far-right sectarian communalist, a uh, member of the BJP and also the RSS, uh, his ideal state is Israel, the Jewish state. I mean, the Indian state is consciously modelling itself on Israel as an ethno-nationalist state, and they're treating uh, the Muslims uh, much as the Jews were. Uh, as second class uh, citizens and their occupation of Kashmir uh, threatens to become really like the occupation of the West Bank by Israel. So there are very, very marked similarities. The RSS, which uh, was the kernel of the BJP, uh, was formed by pe uh, people, Gol Waka, who was uh, a supporter of Nazi Germany, but also a supporter of Zionism. So, I mean, the two are not incompatible. Uh, India today, Yes, it, it is taking exactly that path. Uh, whether uh, Modi succeeds or not in transforming India into an ethno-nationalist state is open to question. Okay, uh, we'll just bring in Paul Fletcher now, please. Yeah, hello. Um, thank you, Tony, for an ins uh, inspiring talk. Um, I didn't actually put my hand up, but um, I did put something... Um, but when I, I perhaps somebody else is pretending to be me. So, um, but just coming back to the uh, briefly about the um, 
Einstein and uh, the letter to the New York Times, which I think I put in the chat, which was signed by Arendt. Um, I, I, I made the comment that I, I think all those public intellectuals who signed that letter would probably have been kicked out of the late, well, would have been kicked out of the Labour Party um, as uh, identifying the new state of Israel as aligned with Naz uh, the Nazis and um, fascism. Um, I, I, um, I think it's important to, and, and you'll probably do this in the later lectures, to understand the liberal position and the ethical, uh, the ideas of ethical Judaism, the righteousness of of being in the testaments, um, as opposed to uh, the lack of ethics in the political Zionist movement. Um, I know Levinas is another figure who was in the concentration camps, who's who kind of sat in the middle of those two positions in some ways. But um, yeah, and also finally, um, I, I've work my way through Judith Butler's book, which is Parting the Ways, which is uh, an analysis of some of the major Jewish um, writers um, and their positions on Zionism and, and Palestine, including Primo Levi and uh, Walter Benjamin. Um, and, but the thing that strikes me about her rent, and I agree with you, she, she's a very interesting character and I, I don't agree with everything, but um, is that she laid a lot of emphasis on the statelessness of uh, the importance of statelessness, which arose out of uh, the Jewess and other dysphorias and and the the value that we should attach to to people uh, to to the refugees. Really, um, I don't know if you you'd like to comment on any of that. Thank you very much. Anyway. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, I've got a couple of other questions. Uh, I'm going to ask comrades, please. It's actually quite difficult to follow chat and the question and answers. Quite a few comments pass by on the chat. So probably the easiest way to make your contribution is to come in and, and talk and ask the question the way that Paul has done. Um, and it also means that we get more of a discussion going. So please, can you do that? We're in the sort of last round now because Tony's worked very hard this evening, and uh, I don't want to strain his voice any further. Um, I've got a, a, a comment there, uh, two comments. One is from uh, George Villeneuve. George says that race is a European invention. Um, and again, the whole issue of race, and, and as Tony's made the point about the invention of uh, Semites and, and so forth, that's um, you know quite, a, quite, quite an important point. So. Maybe Tony would like to look at that. And um, I think it's from Ian McDonald. I'm afraid I've got a little technical problem in that I can't quite see the, um, the text because I'm afraid the chat box moves on. But he says, um, he asked the question, which is an interesting one, Tony. He says, if uh, Tony or other Jewish people are atheist and anti-Zionist, why would they want to retain a Jewish identity uh, and I think that's an interesting question. I mean, it's a very personal question, I'm sure. Um, there was something of a bit of a chat, um, and it's interesting how everybody always brings in their own uh, particular differences about Catholics and Protestants and about whether you're a Catholic atheist and a Protestant atheist. All of this, I think, was very interesting in last week's census, um, how many atheists identified themselves as Catholics or Protestants in Northern Ireland would be, would be very interesting uh, there. Um, so I think we've got a, a couple of other people now who've come in as panelists. Um, and uh, I think Pam, you wanted to come back in. Could you uh, unmute please, Pam? You're still muted. Pam. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Yes, uh, um, this probably may come later, Tony, I don't know, but I was interested in Arab nationalism and uh, 
what was going on in Palestine because we know about the Sykes-Picot agreement where Britain betrayed the Arab nationalist aspirations in the area and just you know drew lines in the sand. Um, and I just wondered what sort of uh, Arab nationalist or socialist or Mar and Marxist movements there were in the Palestinian area um, around the turn of the century or you know, before Balfour and uh, uh, maybe after Balfour. Thanks. Okay, um, I've got a number of uh, speakers. In fact, I've got a couple of Tony Greensteins here. So uh, I think one is uh, enough for any meeting. Um, so uh, would, the, would, the, would the slightly better looking Tony Greenstein with the glasses like to come in, please? <laughs> I'm Tony Greenstein. I'll <laughs> have to do that in the Labour Party. You might not have been thrown out. <laughs> you will be, yes. Yeah. Anyway, my, my, my question comes from that. I, I used to live uh, on Stamford Hill and there's a large Hasidic Jewish community there, which has been there for like, you know, about 100 years, maybe more than 100 years. But to what extent did Zionism touch that? community, you know, the, the growth of Zionism after the Second World War, to what extent did it touch that community and to what extent was it a Zionist community at all? Okay, thanks. Uh, and comrade, can I have your name, please? I, That's I'll, Tim Halpin. Okay, thanks, Tim. Okay, well, look, uh, Tony, I think what we'll do is take those as the last round of questions and then um, you can uh, answer them and then, uh, then sum up. Uh, yes, uh, I, if I start in order, Hannah Arendt, I mean, she had the view, she divided the Jews into two categories, the Jew as a pariah, a Jew as an outsider looking in on uh, society, the dissident, uh, the revolutionary, the social democrat, uh, the awkward customer, and Jews as parvenus who tried to get into society by becoming more Gentiles and the Gentiles themselves. So I mean, she wrote some very interesting essays uh, and she was really a, a quite thoughtful in her own way. Uh, more than that, I really can't say. I mean, it, she wrote quite prolifically as well. She was herself a, a refugee from Nazi Germany. She only just got out. Uh, she was detained in France in a, a camp before escaping. Uh, and then she went to uh, America where she became uh, a famous uh, writer. Uh, but she had a, a difficult relationship with the Zionist movement and in particular recoiled from its supremacist and racist and exclusivist uh, nature. Uh, but uh, her main crime, as I say, was the series of articles she wrote for the New Yorker about the Eichmann trial when she she raised all the issues the Eichmann trial had been designed uh, to cover up. I mean, the Eichmann trial took place in 1961. It, it followed the Kastner trial in Israel in 1954-58 of a, a Jewish collaborator, Rudolf Kastner, who was a leader of Hungarian Zionism. I don't want to go into too much detail about that because it is a subject uh, of another talk, but. Uh, basically, Kastner, who was the leader of Hungarian Zionism, who had collaborated, who had gone to Nuremberg to testify in support of some quite serious Nazi war criminals like Hermann Krumi, Eichmann's second in command, uh, she raised this and other issues. I mean, one of her most famous uh, quotes was when she said, if there had been no Jewish leadership in Europe, uh, then far more Jews would have survived. In other words, it was the existence of that leadership uh, which ensured that there was very little resistance. And she was essentially correct on that. Uh, she took her views on that to a large extent from Raoul Hilberg, who was the foremost uh, historian of the Holocaust, uh, who was also uh, given the cold shoulder in many ways by Zionists, but wrote uh, uh, the most definitive book of the Holocaust to this day, uh, Destruction of European Jews. Uh, as regards the question of race, well, without giving a, a detour into a history of British imperialism, there was a time uh, when British imperialists in places like India believed that uh, 
the Indians could be improved because this was a, this was a justification for empire that you would civilize the natives that the Indians could take over from the British in running uh, their society. Uh, and that was most famously represented by Thomas Macaulay, uh, a Whig historian. But as the 19th century progressed, so racist views, uh, social Darwinism, as it was called, the, the idea of a survival of the fittest being applied to different groups within uh, the human race, uh, took precedent. precedent. Uh, the reason for that uh, was quite simple, really, that if you conquer another person, another people's territory, then you have to have some form of justification. And racial supremacy provided that justification, that we rule over other people because we are superior to them. And why are we superior? Because you were of a different race, whether it's Aryan or British or, or whatever. So that was... Uh, if you like, the swamp into which Zionism was inserted. Zionism never challenged that. It simply said, well, we too are a different race, which is actually what the anti-Semites said. So there's not a great deal of difference between them, but that was the, the, uh, this, the context in which ideas of race uh, developed, uh, improving the race and so on. Uh, selective breeding uh, was uh, very strong in places like uh, the United States. In fact, Hitler, if you read Mein Kampf, he, he took some of his ideas from the United States in terms of the sterilization of mothers who were held to be unfit to bear children and so on. And that, that was quite current uh, in Europe until relatively recently, incidentally, uh, the same ideas have applied in Israel to the Ethiopian Jews. Uh, Ethiopian Jewish women were also sterilized, given Depoprovera, which is a three month contraceptive in order they don't have children. So in Israel today, I mean, there is extreme racism against black Jews. And in fact, there are groups of Jews in Africa, in Uganda, for instance, uh, who uh, the Israeli state says are not Jewish. Uh, and the primary reason is because uh, they are black. Uh, a million Jews were let in from Russia. Uh, a third of whom were, were not Jewish. Many of them were Christians, but they were allowed in because they were su seen to be of a superior stock or race. So those ideas uh, have uh, percolated throughout uh, the Zionist uh, movement. Uh, why retain, someone said, a Jewish identity? Well, perhaps if there was no Israeli state and there was no Zionism, uh, I would have become an atheist and abandoned being Jewish altogether. I mean, I, I, I don't know, because it, it's a what if question. But the fact is that Israel does claim to be a Jewish state and it claims to represent all Jews every, everywhere. It's the state of the Jews. So I have more rights than someone who's Palestinian. I mean, although I probably wouldn't get into Israel because of my uh, activities and views, I have a right to return in inverted commas to Israel anytime I choose uh, to claim various grants to settle there uh, and to establish myself. And I would become a full citizen as of right uh, through the Israeli nationality law and the law of return. Palestinians who are expelled, of course, have no such right. They may have been born there. Their families may have lived there for generations, but they have no rights whatsoever. So, I mean, this is the most clear example of Zionist racism. So why do I choose to retain my Jewish identity? Because I think it's uh, important that Jewish people do speak out. Uh, and that's what I've done for most of my life uh, to the annoyance of the Zionists. Uh, what was going on in Palestine at the time of the Balfour Declaration? Well, the Palestinians were starting to become aware of the Zionist presence, uh, the settlement colonies and so on, because they were established on land which had been bought mainly from absentee landlords. Sir Suk was the most famous. He owned the whole of the Jezreel Valley and he was based in Beirut. So Arab uh, landlords uh, were selling this land and the, the Zionist settlers, the socialist Zionist settlers no less, were expelling the peasants from that land because as early as 1901, the Jewish National Fund was set up and its remit was to redeem land in Palestine. And what that meant is once you buy it, it's 
forever, forever alienated from the Palestinians from whom it was bought or taken. And that, that applies to this very day. The Jewish National Fund owns and controls with the Israeli Land Authority 93% of the land of Israel. And that is land that Palestinians, Israeli Palestinians, do not have access to. So hundreds of Jewish communities exist, uh, which have reception committees, and they are legally established. They're, they're recognized in law by the reception committee's uh, law in 2011 as being able to exclude whoever they want. Uh, it doesn't say they have the right to exclude Arabs, but they have the right to exclude anyone who doesn't fit in. And that means Arabs first and foremost, not just Arabs, Ethiopian Jews will also be excluded and so on. It's a thoroughly racist enterprise. Uh, but in uh, 1915, 16, the Arabs were starting to become aware. The first book uh, on Palestinian nationalism was the Arab Awakening. Uh, and that is true. I mean, the Palestinians were a nation which in many ways was created by the Zionist settlement. Uh, uh, Palestine was often referred to as Syria. It wasn't uh, an entity in its own right. It was uh, administered from Beirut and Damascus. So, uh, you know, Palestine really became came into its own as a result of the British mandate. And increasingly, uh, the Palestinians resisted. There were riots in 1921. There were very major riots in 1929, which led to the establishment of the Hope Simpson uh, uh, Royal Commission and anyone who wants to actually understand what was going on and what the Zionists were doing cannot do better than read the Hope Simpson report. Uh, it, it was a, a report which described in detail the activities of the Zionists and how they impacted on the Palestinians. There was in fact one member of the Hope Simpson inquiry who dissented and he was the Labour Party representative. So this, this gives some idea of the involvement of the Labour Party in Zionism from the year dot. Uh, Paul Zionist say was affiliated in 1920. It was never a Jewish section. Paul Zionist represented hardly any Jews and it barely had 500 members. Zionism was uh, a minority taste, especially in the Jewish East End. Uh, it, it made no sense. And in fact, the Zionists didn't even want workers involved or joining it because it would be more trouble than it was worth. I mean, the Jewish East End was a uh, a haven of Jewish radicals, anarchists, socialists, communists. Uh, and in fact, in 1945, uh, the first communist MP to be elected, not the first communist MP, but the first communist MP to be elected as a communist was Phil Paratton in the Mile End constituency, a small constituency in the East End. And it's estimated that half of his voters were Jewish. Compare that to today when uh, Jewish vote voters uh, vote conservative in overwhelming numbers and you see there's been a massive change in Jewish identity and that's the point I want to emphasize that Jewish identity has never been fixed it's always been uh, something subject to change the identity of Jewish traders Jewish money lenders the agents of money gave way to Jewish uh, workers uh, and proletarians and revolutionaries and eventually uh, uh, Zionism. Uh, but uh, I would suspect that Zionism is the last Jewish identity. Uh, I'm trying to get a, yeah, Zionism in Stamford Hill. Well, Stamford Hill is an ultra Orthodox community and they, they're generally, they're not represented by the Board of Deputies. The Union of Orthodox Hebrew Congregations is a separate organization from the Jewish Board of Deputies. They make up Orthodox Jews approximately 20% uh, of the Jewish population in Britain. I mean, some will undoubtedly be Zionist or in Zionist inclined, but there are many of them who will reject Zionism. And in fact, during the attacks by the Board of Deputies against Jeremy Corbyn, the union, the leading rabbis of the Union of Orthodox Congregations issued a letter signed by 31 of them dissociating themselves from attacks on Jeremy Corbyn. And Corbyn always had very friendly relations with Orthodox Jews. Of course, this letter, which you would have thought would have received massive publicity, received absolutely no publicity in the British media, apart from the Jewish Chronicle itself, which tried to pour cold water on it, and Squawk Box, which did a number of very useful features on it. Uh, but they 
tend to a non-Zionism rather than a Zionism. They're certainly not integrated into the Zionist structures in Britain. And the Board of Deputies is primus in paris, as far as that is concerned. Uh, as regards, again, uh, the Jewish race and DNA, really, I, I think people should leave this to the right. Uh, I mean, Zionism, of course, does claim there's a biological uh, attachment to Palestine. Uh, in a sense, I mean, that's what Hitler and the anti-Semites claimed as well, that Jews did not belong in Europe because they belonged in Palestine. I don't think we should really go into that. The, even if Jews in Europe were, were somehow descended from Palestine, so what? I mean, can I come to your house because my relatives lived in it 2000 years ago and claim that I have rights of ownership and you should get out now before I call the police? Of course not, I mean, it's an absolute nonsense. The idea that even if Jews in Europe did have some connection to the Jews or the Hebrews of 2000 years ago, that they have any political rights is a complete nonsense. I mean, the reality in, in Palestine or Canaan or whatever you call it 2000 years ago was that Hebrew tribesmen were part of a, all sorts of other tribes, Philistines, Canaanites, Moabites, you name it. Yeah, uh, There was no nothing particularly special. There are two Jewish states of sorts. Uh, Judah and Israel uh, in Palestine around four to 600 BC. They ended up fighting each other. Uh, there was certainly no single Jewish state uh, which predominated uh, in, in it. And they fell under the sway of the Assyrians and uh, the Romans and were, were eventually defeated by, I think it was Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian ruler. So, uh, I mean, this is all a nonsense. I mean, Jews of the religious center of Judaism has been Jerusalem, but no one ever thought of actually going there, uh, except for the ultra orthodox who went there to pray and die. But they, they had no political ambitions. Uh, I, I tend to dismiss these DNA uh, analyses because they actually prove absolutely nothing. And politically, they have no implications whatsoever. Your rights in any territory derived from the fact you live there. And Jews in the diaspora don't live there, so they, they should have absolutely no rights. Thank you. Is well, there... thanks very much, uh, Tony, and uh, thanks to all the comrades who spoke or um, asked questions. So uh, that's the end of our first uh, uh, historical session. Uh, as Tony indicated, there are a few more sessions to come dealing with uh, some of those um, you know, really quite contentious and actually very important uh, sections about the development of Zionism into the 20th century. But we, we've got off to a good start, good discussion, good questions. So uh, I'd like to thank Tony, uh, kept up a cracking pace um, and only did it with the aid of one fag, Tony. That was uh, well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, thank you very much uh, we'll see you next Friday and uh, just to remind you that there are also um, LLA uh, education sessions on a Thursday evening and uh, also videos of our previous sessions and indeed this one will be available on the LLA uh, education section on the website and I think on YouTube as well so thanks very much and thanks once again Tony for uh, for uh, giving us such an interesting uh, talk and a very important one. Well, thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Bye, everybody, and Bye. Uh, see you next Friday or next Thursday. <laughs>